No intro song? Oh, I have a plan so good for you guys. Alrighty. Well, thank you guys. My name is Dr. Josh Silver. Thank you for coming. Thank you for waking up early. Thank you, gods of orthospinology, for scheduling me at 8 a.m. today. <laughs> That's right. So I'm an upper cervical doctor, probably the world's most passionate. I'm also a functional neurologist. I've been practicing just about 10 years now in St. Petersburg, Florida, about 30 minutes south of here. And I love what I do every single day as a dance into the office for me. And so we have some big things to share today. I'm going to be talking about comb beam. I'm going to be talking about neurology. But before we talk about any of that, I have to talk about one of my most influential mentors from the 90s, and that would be... This man right here, does anybody know who this guy is? Ash Ketchum, baby. And he was the head protagonist on the hit 90s series, Pokemon. And something that Ash Ketchum would say very often that struck me deeply as a boy was that Ash Ketchum wanted to be, I want to be the very best, like no one ever was. To catch them all is my real quest, and to train them is my cause. And so he was talking about being the Pokemon master. He wanted to catch all the Pokemon, train all the Pokemon, but... He wanted to be the best like no one ever was. And having heard that several thousand times as a child, that was the energy I brought into chiropractic school. Because I don't want to be a good chiropractor. I don't want to be a great chiropractor. I want to be the world's best chiropractor. That's my goal. And do I think I'm the world's best chiropractor? Absolutely not. Not when Cameron Bearders are walking around. So there's a high bar. But I hope that today I can inspire all of you guys to be the best in the world. Because if you push yourself and you have that motivation, you'll come up with some really cool stuff. And it started for me in 2016. My first job was at the Pierce Clinic of Chiropractic, the headquarters of Advanced Orthogonal. I studied with Dr. Pierce Sr., the creator, and I learned the work. I practiced the work to the textbook, to the textbook. But the longer I practiced, the more frustrated I became with the mastoid support. Who here uses the mastoid support? Everybody, right? That's how it's been done. Why do we use a mastoid support, Dr. Pierce? Well, Josh, because that's how it's always been done. That's not good enough for me. And I had seen an iteration of an entire school support headpiece used in NUCA before, and I had also seen one done in QSM3. And for me, I wouldn't really know if we had to do mastoid unless I tested mastoid. So I created a prototype called the entire school support headpiece that basically holds everything except the mastoid, the back of the occiput, the front, and then the top. And it gave the patients a little bit more support. So what we did was we did a research project at the Pierce Clinic. I did 10 patients pre-post x-rays on this thing versus the mastoid support to see, am I actually getting reductions at all? And yes, I was. I was getting great reductions, very comparable, if not better, to what I was doing on the mastoid support. And so I switched. I switched over to a little bit of a different model because I was able to think outside the box and challenge old norms and be courageous enough to get out of my own way and push myself to do it and find something different that hopefully could help elevate my quality of care to my patients a little bit more. And so patients loved it. They were more comfortable on it. They could relax. I didn't feel as frustrated trying to get them right. And I use this from 2016 to 2019, but in 2019, I no longer had an advanced orthogonal instrument percussion. And I switched to an orthospinology table-mounted Laney percussion. And so I switched back to mastoid support in 2019 with the Laney machine. And I gave it another two years of bitter frustration before I glued this one onto my new Laney table. But that didn't make any sense. So we redesigned it again last year. And I made a little bit extra because extra is my middle name. I put a joystick in it. I put motors in it. And now I can move these supports up, down, left, right, and really customize that adjustment perfectly for my patient. And so um, this is something that I do. I've gotten about three of them out in the profession this year. I've gotten about 20 of these out into the profession over the last 10 years. Uh, Chad, Randy, anybody in here that's using it? Not today, but that's OK. I love this thing, man. It's good, right? It's solid. And so what I'm trying to share with you guys about this piece is that if you have a good idea, you don't, don't just sit around and wait for somebody to come up with it, right? I could have waited 10 years, 20 years before somebody came up with this. But if you have a good idea, 
get out of your own way and do it because you can do anything you want to do. You just stop yourself from doing it. And once I realized how easy this stuff is, you hire the engineer, got him on freelance for, for 300 bucks out of Korea. It was great. And now we got a new thing that can help patients. And so the story continues that I did x-rays. I did traditional x-rays, digital, for the first four and a half years of my career. But in 2016, Jay Colliwell released to the world that cone beam CT was a way of the future and that that's what he was doing for Articular and it was working quite nicely for him. And I was fascinated, but unfortunately I was orthogonal and there was no good analysis at the time of how to do a cone beam analysis for orthogonal. It didn't exist. But in 2019, again, things changed for me. I left an upper cervical practice and I joined a functional neurology practice where they didn't have an x-ray machine, but the owner was friends with an orthodontist with a cone beam CT, and he had a large field of view. He could see so much. So I, I went to lunch with the dentist, and I said, send me one of these cone beams you got. Sent me a couple, and I started playing with these images on my computer late at night, trying to piece together an analysis system for orthogonal that was really based off of the traditional x-ray lines we would do, right? We'd line them up for a frontal, take all the rotation out, and measure the plane line. And I could do that on cone beam. I had one application on my computer that measured angles. I had a different application on my computer that I would screenshot and import and measure the C over A. I had about seven different tools I was using to get this measurement done. It was taking me about an hour but it's okay, this is like the first time in the world we're doing orthogonal off of cone beam. It was so exciting and I could build a listing. So I started adjusting patients off of cone beam CT in 20, early 2020 and they started getting results. It started working, of course it would work. It's the same thing we've always done on x-ray. We're just doing it on a slightly different modality. And that was great and all, and I did that, but as I started doing this in Santa Barbara, I was the only upper cervical doctor in the town, and I started getting busy with upper cervical patients, and this analysis was no longer going to cut it, taking an hour per scan. So kind of out of um, my own necessity, I found another, um, through freelancer.com, my favorite website, I found a software engineer out of Madagascar, and I said, hey, man, what I need is a, a tool that can help me measure the CO over A a little bit better, a little bit quicker. He says, no problem, 100 bucks. I'm like, that's it? Can we do a cephalo? 100 bucks. 100 bucks this, 100 bucks that, 100 bucks that. And, and after about a year of working with him, we had created a new software that I call the Upper Cervical Toolkit that allows us as orthogonists to get measurements off of cone beam so that we can actually start to enter into the next phase of what I think upper cervical is headed towards. And so, you know, everybody is all like, oh, cone beam, it sounds cool, but it's too complicated. And it's not too complicated. It's actually really simple, so simple that I'm gonna try to attempt to teach and show you guys how I do an analysis in the next 16 minutes. So, play video. Right, so when you open up a cone beam, you can do it in 3D or you can do it in multiplanar reconstruction where you get three images like this. And, and this takes 30 seconds for me to capture this image. No more 15, 20 minutes of x-ray positioning. 30 seconds, sit there, and it's done. And once the image is captured, you need to think of these lines, these yellow, pink, and blue lines, as the tilt tube. And if I wanna get a different view, I can change my tilt tube without having the patient come back and sit down and reshoot it. I can just tilt it. And so we're assembling our S line here and we're assembling our frontal right here. And all we're doing is using Radiant, a totally typical viewing software, to position. Think about it as right now we're just positioning the image for measurement. We would normally do this on the x-ray chair, but I'm setting us up for a frontal and when we take full thickness into account, this is typically what you get to play with in practice. And where the heck is the atlas? It's behind a whole lot of bone. 
But the beauty of CT is that you can choose your slice thickness. Where in that shot is the slice? And so we want to reduce everything that we don't need to see that's getting in the way, so we only reveal what we really want to see. So coming back from the start, what we're going to do is we're going to take rotation out of this image because nobody measures rotated frontals. Again, we're trying to do traditional but on comb beam. So we roughly set it up on the dens. I roughly set it up on the center of the face. It looks generally unrotated. But what I like to do here is minimize that thickness down to nothing. And that way I can see a single slice. And if all I'm seeing is a single slice through the head, then as I scroll through the head, things should appear at the same time. The jaw should show up at the same time. The eye should show up at the same time. The ear should show up at the same time. And that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing that this left TMJ is shown up then earlier than the right one. On a single slice, they should show up at the exact same time. So part of the way I'm removing rotation on this frontal is seeing, does it all appear together and disappear together? And if it doesn't, all I do is I slightly modify the tilt of this blue and boom, an unrotated frontal. And part of the beauty of comb beam is it's not you get four images, good luck. You have unlimited possibilities of images once you've obtained this. You just have to do the positioning. And so now we see the eyes appear together. We see the jaw appear together. We see the ears appear together. There's no rotation on this frontal. And what that means to me is that this is my horizontal cephalic line. That blue line is perfectly horizontal. We're going to need that later to measure rotation. So we're measured or ready to measure head tilt. It's the first measurement I do. Frontal cephalic line, frontal cranial line. And this is a toolkit. I opened it already. It's this blue bar on top of the screen. It happened so quick you didn't see it because we're used to you know, taking a picture and importing it. But toolkit's an overlay. It just goes on top of what's on your screen. And it just has the tools we need as orthogonists to measure. So I opened it. I have a vertical angle tool that I built into it. And I'm starting to measure this head tilt is to the left by what looks like four degrees. And we're used to measuring all on one shot, right? Oh, it's acute by this much on this side, acute by that side. But the truth is, is that you can measure a head tilt to the right of one degree. You can separately measure a plane line high of right one degree, and you can infer a right laterality of two degrees. You don't have to measure on one shot. You can break it up and then reassemble it. And that's what I've done with this, is if we just put in the head tilt at the top, it will compare that to our plane line later to calculate our upper angle and lower angles. So this is our workaround on comb beam to not do one shot. And so here I built a cephalo tool. Some members in NUCA asked me for it. I said, no problem. Probably a hundred bucks for my engineer. And it's exactly the same. <laughs> it's exactly the same as what we did in VizTech. You, you rotate it, you plus, you minus it. You square it up to your image, and when you're happy with it, you hit enter, and you'll get a frontal cranial line. Was that hard? Was that that different than what we've been doing the last 50 years, right? We just did the imaging and the comb beam instead, but the measurement's roughly the same. However, you have more options for measurement. You can measure head tilt like this. Sometimes I measure head tilt on 3D. Sometimes I measure head tilt based off of the occiput. I choose how and what to measure. And what I'm trying to show you guys is that this isn't how we need to be doing this in this technique. This is how I do this. And what I'm presenting to you guys is simply a ruler, a tool that we can use to measure anything we need to measure. And with that, again, we open the doors for orthogonal to enter comb beam into the next dimension. So take your measurements, enter them into the main calculation box, top to bottom. It's fairly user-friendly, and it will just spit out your listing there at the bottom. The first one is head tilt. The next one would be plane line. And so traditionally, we do plane line off that posterior arch, correct? Agreed? However, in advanced orthogonal, we like to mark the superior lateral masses and the inferior lateral masses because those are a little bit closer to the joints. And so if you want, you can do that. And I've broken that enter box into superior and inferior sections. 
Or if you want to stay traditional, you just measure your posterior arch and you put that into both boxes. I created this idea of the triple plane line. Let's take the top of the atlas, compare it to head tilt to measure our upper angle. Let's take the bottom of the atlas, compare it to the neck to measure our lower angle, and let's average them to make a plane line. That's my triple plane line theory, but it's advanced. Okay, we don't have to do that. We can stick with traditional time-tested and proven methods just doing it on comb beam where things are going to be a lot easier. You know, like comb beam sitting out there is going into my office on Sunday. That's my unit. And un honestly, compared to the price of a new x-ray, it's about the same. So, so why when this is available? People are like, I'm waiting for comb beam. I'm waiting for comb beam. It's here. It's been here for a year already with toolkit. I think we have 10 active users now, so we're doing good. So, so we're just opening it up to plain line right now. And so we've got our atlas, we've zoomed in, we've cut off the jaw, we've cut off everything in the back. We can see what we're looking at, but we don't want to measure a plain line on a single slice of the atlas. We want to measure it on a little bit of thickness. And the reason why is because we're head on with the skull. But what if that atlas is rotated? If the atlas is rotated and we're seeing one slice, we may be seeing a more anterior section of it than the back of it. So to get around that, I add a little bit of thickness so we can see the full depth of that atlas. We mark the top of it, we mark the bottom of it, we record our measurements. Is that that complicated? Simple. It's, it's exactly what we've been doing but now we have the tools to do it on comb beam. Do I think this is the end all be all? Absolutely not. I would love an AI generated automatic vector calculation software. We worked on that for a while, but having talked to a lot of doctors that have been doing this, would you trust a computer to tell you your vectors? I wanna know, I wanna see it myself. So we can't do that, yeah. I mean, they're never parallel because people are genetically aberrant and their atlas is higher on one side than the other. Always, always, right? God didn't make us symmetrical. So it is what it is. I record what I find. So I, I, I try to go with the best fits. If it's totally in disagreement, I use the superior and the inferior and I throw out the posterior arch. Because what does a posterior arch have to do with the C0, C1 joint? Nothing. It could be built like that because God felt like it that day. So, so we're setting ourselves up for our cervical spine tilt, right? And we're going to take the tilt of our neck and we're going to compare that to our plane line. And we should be able to figure out our lower angle. And so now I'm just kind of setting us up to see the neck. And we can see it full thickness, thin thickness. We can do it without the jaw obscuring that lower neck because I chose to crop the jaw out on comb beam today. And I'm gonna show you how I, got, I do this. I open the toolkit, I have a center point tool, I center out the dens, I'm going to center out the lower neck. This is traditional. But then usually you center point the dens with the C2 spinous so you can find the middle of the neural canal and that's the top of your cervical spine line. But it's high, kind of hard to see that C2 spinous right now on this thickness. Like, I think it's in this region. I'm just gonna stick it there because it looks close. But what I like to do once I've placed those is if I drop this down to a single slice of thickness now, that C2 spinous is gonna jump out at me. And let's see if I was right. As we scroll through it, through it, through it, boom. Now I know exactly where that C2 spine is. I'm not trying to search through the fog. I mark it, and now I'm ready to record the tilt of my neck. All right? Basically the same as what we've been doing. Do I think this is how we should need to be doing in the future? Not necessarily. Maybe, you know, let's change the technique. Let's change it all if that's what's indicated. I'm not married to this doing it because that's how we've done it. Whatever is best for the patient. And as we discover more, because we can see more, hopefully we adapt. Hopefully we adapt. And so now we have all of really our, our sagittal lines, your plane line, your head tilt, your neck. How long did that take us to do? Not significantly longer than it would to do on X, right? 
But remind you that we already saved about 14 minutes on, on image capture. So we're already ahead of the game. And so now what we need to do is C over A. And C over A, um, that was the hardest one for me when I first started doing cone beam. Right? How do we measure the diameter of a circle, especially with an overlay software that isn't intrinsically tied to the image? But Dr. Bo had done a video years ago about him doing this where he calibrates the toolkit. And I said, that's a genius idea. Genius idea. So let's prepare the image first for C over A, and then we'll calibrate. And normally, this is where we would measure C over A, is straight down that plane line. But look at the C1, C2 joint, and look how it opens. You see how it kind of opens as I brought that plane line down? Can we rewind that for just like 10 seconds? All righty, guys. All righty, all righty. Focus, focus, focus. Look at C1, C2 on our S line. And as I move that S line, look at C1, C2 open. Did you see that? Do I have to do it again? <laughs> Leave it, perfect, just let it play. Okay, what, what we do in advanced orthogonal is we don't measure our axial circle off of our, off of our S line because as C2 has a different perspective, whether he's looking down, straight ahead, or up, you'll look across the top of C2 differently on X-ray and that will shadow out the actual top of him. And so I like to level out C2 till that joint is as open as it's going to be. And I think that gives me a better axial circle than doing this drop-down method. Is it the right way of doing it? I don't know, but it's how I do it because it gives me what I think is a more real measurement than doing it um, traditionally. I'm still preparing everything, just trying to get it right. Checking my timer. And so I have YouTubes on my website, many, many, many videos of me going through analysis in 2D, in 3D, for free, for the profession, because ultimately at my core, I wanna help as many sick people get well. That's my real mission. And I think that if I can improve your guys' ability to help patients get well and hold better because you have better imaging and you can properly see what's actually going on, then I get to help more people through you. And so I've created this software to be a simple starting entry point for us as orthogonists to start being able to measure off of cone beam. And um, I've got it on my website. I put it at an outrageous price of $1,000 for a lifetime. And that way, hopefully, I can make this software affordable so it actually becomes used so that we actually get to help people. Because what good is it if, that, if nobody's using it? And so I wish, yeah. Well, it's a video recording, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just have to grab that axis and pull it all the way around. So I'm gonna cut my cone beam presentation just a minute short, because we were gonna do rotation, we were going to measure C2 rotation, and then after that we would have all the pieces we need. I built this calculator so that it's got a calculate button, so you hit calculate, and boom, there's your height factor, your RF, your RA, everything you need to do to adjust the patient. I built into this so that we can do that. I made it work with Advo, with Epic, with Orthospinology, so that we're using laterality and lower angle and, and language that you guys are familiar with. And, um, and that's, that's Combi. I hope you guys like that. And so I would love to talk more and more and more about this, but I actually had a bigger agenda tonight or today or this morning, and that was to talk about upper cervical neurology. So would you full screen that for me? Okay. And so, so I've been a diplomate in, upper, in chiropractic neurology since 2014. 2011, Dr. Carrick showed up to Life West, and he showed us him fixing a patient with Tourette syndrome by blowing warm air in the right ear. And that changed my entire world. I said, I need to learn this whole idea of how the brain works and how we can simulate the brain and induce neuroplastic changes just like that. And it was my second quarter. I, I signed up for his 300-hour program while I was running the upper cervical club because I was in both camps at the time. I, I got my diploma in 2014. I joined an upper cervical practice. I worked as a strict upper cervical doctor for five years, 
where we had seven and a half long minute visit times, which really frankly wasn't enough time to do functional neurology, but it was enough time to become great at upper cervical. And so I felt a bit of a fraud having a diplomate in neurology I didn't really use for much, except for studying and teaching upper cervical neuropathophysiology, which in my opinion is one of the most important things we need to know as chiropractors is what goes wrong when they subluxate. And somehow chiropractic school didn't teach us that. Blows my mind. So I created this model of the upper cervical subluxation, and I taught about this for years. Uh, you, you, I think we can really put it into three different categories, right? We have our neurostructural things where neurons are being affected. They're being structurally changed from the misalignment. And then we have our vascular changes where blood flow is changing and, and cerebral spinal fluid is changing. And we could spend hours on this slide, and we should, but really today, I have to bring it into the neurological feed forward because as a chiropractic neurologist, this is what we talk about is these pathways. And when we talk about the subluxation creating disafferentation, where the heck is that disafferentation even going? Super relevant for us. And so the cervical proprioceptors richest in the upper cervical spine do feed into this trigeminal cervical nucleus that Bogdo talked about. And as neck pain neurons converge with other head and face pain neurons. Multimodal convergence can cause referral pain where upper neck pain can be felt as head pain or eye pain or migraine or headaches. And so when you adjust a patient and their headaches improve, the mechanism that improved them is probably cervical proprioceptors recalibrating the trigeminal cervical nucleus. That's a cool pathway. And then we also know about the Cervical proprioceptors influence the nucleus intermedius. And the nucleus intermedius is a really important group of neurons in the lower brain stem that, head, that relays heart to neck related information. So if I twist my neck real hard to the left, because I got to look that way, cervical proprioceptors say, hey, we got to upbeat the heart, an extra pump to get enough blood there so that I don't pass out from that rapid velocity change. And so there is this marriage right there through the nucleus intermediates, down into the nucleus tractus solitaris, out the vagus nerve, to the heart, to modulate the heart as it needs to in relationship to head and neck activity. It's a pretty cool thing. And so this is probably why blood pressure changes. This is probably why heart rate changes. This explains some of the autonomic changes we see in practice, which is pretty stinking cool. But most passionate of mine is the vestibular nucleus, and so chronically underplayed in chiropractic because the vestibular nucleus in your brainstem is your non-conscious relay of, listen close, where am I in space? That's the job of the vestibular nucleus, is where the heck am I? Because I need to know where I am in order for me to do anything. In order for me to walk over there, I need to know where I am. And in order for me to walk over there, it's gonna depend if I'm here, or here, or here, or here, where I am in space, changes the motor commands necessary to achieve my goal. So the vestibular nucleus fires down through the vestibular spinal tone, or vestibular spinal tract, to control spinal muscle tones as they relate to posture and balance on a subconscious level. Because if I was to raise my arm like this, voluntarily raise my arm, long before that arm raises, reflexively my right foot stiffens up so that I don't fall over when I raise my arm. And I never thought about that right foot. I didn't need to. It's being controlled through the vestibulospinal tract. And so I think that when we have disaffrontation into the vestibular nuclei down the vestibulospinal tract, what we see is twisted postures, short legs, back pain, neck pain, knee pain, and all the wonderful things that go away when we do an upper cervical adjustment and see their body balance and their legs length even and their back pain changes, I think the mechanism most likely is that we're modulating proprioceptors to nucleus to spinal muscle tone. How cool is that? Super duper cool. Super duper cool. Vestibular nucleus also fires up to control eye movement because where am I in space? Where is my neck? Depends on what I want to see. And if I want to look at you, but my neck is turning to the left, my neck needs to tell my eyes to move right. There's an interplay between them. There are a lot of connections between the neck and the eyes. And it's why the research is pretty clear that following car accident, their pursuits go to crap. 
their gaze holding goes to crap, their saccades become dysmetric. When you injure the neck, their eye movements suffer. And so clinically, what does that look like to you? You adjust them and their eye movements got better? Well, Cam has some fantastic data showing that's exactly what happens. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes. That's important. But also, whenever your eye movements are off, your eyes can't see the world around you. And there's a moment of slip where the world slips on your retina. And it's so fast that consciously, or you don't even realize it happened, but your brain goes, what just happened? Where am I? Did I almost fall? Whenever that vision gets blurry. And so ocular motor, poor ocular motor control can translate into poor cortex function because now you've compromised your visual system. And what do patients feel when they have poor eye movement and poor cortex firing? Dizziness, cervicogenic dizziness, probably the mechanism that we are correcting with our adjustment. And let me not forget that we are big old walking bags of blood and we're moving under gravity. And when I tilt to the left, gravity pulls blood to my left. And so it is important that my vestibular system, where am I in space, talks to my blood flow system to shuttle blood up to the right half of my, my brain, or else I would pass out. And so there is this last pathway here from the vestibular nucleus into the nucleus tractus solitarius. Where I am affects blood flow. And this, again, is likely the mechanism that us upper cervical chiropractors are able to help dysautonomia patients. Does that make sense? Pots, anybody here ever help a patient with pots? Why? Now you know why. And so this is awesome. High five to me, I'm a great doctor. However, having spent the last 13 years chasing the neuro geeks around, the truth is, is that I think this is one third of the piece of the puzzle because that's not the only input to the vestibular nucleus. Like I said, how our eyes move affects what our brain sees. What our brain sees affects of what I consciously think of where I am in space. And if I think I'm turning left or I think I'm turning right, my conscious part of that fires back into my vestibular nucleus to help modulate it the exact same way the cervical proprioceptors do. So guess what happens if you have poor eye movements? All the same problems. Dr. Carrick talks about dysautonomia improving when he gets the cods to move faster. He talks about posture changing when you can improve a left pursuit. What happens if the patient cannot do a left pursuit? They turn their neck to the left anytime they're trying to see something move left. And now that they have increased cervical movement and they have increased instability and it's harder to get them to hold and you're like, are you sure I have their numbers, right? What's going on? And it's because they have a totally unrelated issue with their eye movement control that's stopping your ability to stabilize them because it's part of the web. It's part of the web. So I think that we are doing one third of the puzzle. I think eye movements are a third of the piece of the pie. And then I think vestibular ear, our friggin' ear, is a huge part of the pie that we just like conveniently forget exists in upper cervical. But what happens if you were to sever the vestibular nerve? Does anybody know? You get a head tilt. How well is that going to adjust out? What happens when you cut cranial nerve four, the superior oblique muscle, and they can't rotate their eye anymore, and their eye starts to rotate? They tilt their head so they can see. It's not the writing reflex we've talked about. It's the opposite of the writing reflex. We tilt our head so that we can untorque our vision. And so all of these things can play back into the exact thing we're trying to do. And what happens if you cut that inner ear nerve? Postural dysfunction, balance dysfunction, dizziness, dysautonomia, all the same things that happen from an atlas subluxation. And so what I think is that I think if we can, as upper cervical doctors, tune in a little bit to some of the other afferents, then we can A, help our patients hold better, but B, fully round out their care. Because how many times have you had that patient that got 70% better? And you're like, dang, I wish I could just get you to 100. But you didn't know about this. Now that I know about it, I, I, there's ways that we can work on it. And so what I did was I studied functional neurology for 11 years. Then I started getting into 
proprioceptive deep tendon reflex and muscle testing about three years ago. And I used to be a hardcore skeptic of muscle testing. That stuff's woo-woo. But having studied neurology, I came to this understanding that if a muscle goes weak, it's not a weak muscle, it's an inhibited muscle. And if I can do a stimulation to your nervous system that creates global hypotonia, every muscle goes weak, that's a suitable examination for me that we've found the lesion. And so what I did was I assembled treatments based off of muscle testing and these concepts, and I put them all together into one class about how do we look at the eyes, the ears, all the other cervical proprioceptors and the FCM and the scalenes and the splenius, how do we look at all of those as upper cervical doctors and then know how to treat them in two to three minutes in our practice without you having to do the last 13 years of functional neurology like I've done. And so we taught our first class in May of this year. My profession showed up big for me. A lot of these people are in this room. And what I think is that the best way for me to really explain what it is is for me to show you what it looks like. And so we have roughly eight minutes left for me to play. I think that gives me time for one case. So has anybody in here ever had a concussion? Does anybody keep your hand up if you have dizziness? All right, let's take Deborah. Actually, not Deborah. We worked on you before. We'll take you. And I, don't, I, I was expecting a stage. I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this, so you might want to huddle up. Come on in. <sighs> and so part of my, what's your name? Jonathan. Jonathan Pazzo. You know, it's real easy for Dr. Humber to come up here and talk about his best case. This isn't my best case. This is somebody I've never met before. So uh, this is about talking the talk. So um, don't tell me anything. We're going to let your body show me what is going on. OK? <laughs> Have you ever done muscle testing before? OK, great. So I'm going to have you bring both arms out, elbows straight and forward. And what we need to do is step one, we need to see, is he strong and is he testable? Because there's five steps. Are they testable? Where is the problem? What's the problem? How do we fix it? Let's fix it. The five steps are very forward. So nice and strong. Let's see if we are strong in the clear. And we are strong in the clear. And over here, we are strong in the clear. We're strong in the clear. And over here, hold. Strong in the clear and hold. Strong in the clear. He's a nice, strong guy, which is good, which is what we want. But more importantly is that we're able to go weak when we're supposed to go weak. Because as I'm walking and my arm swings forward, my tricep needs to inhibit. And what happens if my tricep doesn't inhibit? I don't have any arm swing when I walk. And so there's supposed to inhibit. And there's many ways to inhibit a patient, but my favorite is the parallel lines phenomenon. Because when you're looking at X and vision's your primary sensory organ, your brain is cross, we think. But when you're looking at parallel lines, what we think is that it uncrosses the brain. And what do you get? Not good. So arms out, elbows straight, eyes on the X, nice and strong, and hold. He's good. Hold. He's good. Looking at the parallel lines, he inhibits appropriately. He inhibits appropriately. <laughs> He inhibits appropriately, he inhibits appropriately, and then we flip him good again. And this means step one, he's testable, this is normal. I do call it the magic show, because there's so many ways of doing it. Arms out, elbows straight. If something was going to tear your nose off to the floor, are you going to go up or down? Down. So if we push the nose down, we'll get the same thing. But if we push the nose up, now he's going up, and the anti-deltoid works well. So he's testable. So next step is where is the problem? And I've simplified this down to two stimulations. One stimulation is going to be my hand. The next stimulation are my words. So we start with arm out, elbow straight, nice and tall, eyes closed. And do we have a big problem here? Do we have a big problem here? Normal. Do we have a big problem here? Normal. Do we have a big problem here? Abnormal. Abnormal, abnormal. Try. Hold, strong, left vestibular. Wait, I'm cluing into where the problem is, left vestibular. And we're going to get more scientific in a minute, but I like to quick hack it by just asking the body. So eyes closed, nice and strong. Left vestibular, is it a canal issue? Is it an otolith issue? Is it in your saccule? Is it in your utricle? 
Do you have a left utricle lesion? He's got a left utricle lesion. Utricle is an inner ear receptor that that tells your brain you're tilting or you're translating. Because when your eyes are closed and you do this, how do you know you're tilting left? Your neck didn't move. Your eyes were closed. You didn't see anything. You have a tilt receptor in your ear. And when you tilt your head to the right, and he uses his right utricle, eyes closed, hold, he's fine. Hold, right head tilt, he's fine. But if he tilts that head left, that left utricle inhibits this arm. Hold, inhibits this arm. We could go on. Every muscle in his body is shut off right now. His legs, his neck, everything is shut off from this lesion. And what happens when you have a left utricle lesion? Feet together, eyes closed. They're unstable, they lean left. And what happens when they have a left utricle lesion? They tilt their head left and their eyes roll left. So what we need to do is we need to remind your brain how to tilt left. Got it? (laughs) We gotta remind his brain how to tilt left. So what happens when my head tilts left? My eyes roll this way, they should roll this way. One way to encourage intorsion of his eyes is to have him look away from the tilt, because then he'll use superior muscles that will roll his eyes. So with the eyes closed, we're weak and we can't tilt left. If you look up and to the left, hold, doesn't help. Look up and to the right, helps. Down and right, doesn't help. Down left, doesn't help. Upright, solid. Upright, upright. Solid. We have found one thing to help him do what he cannot do. He can't tilt left, but he can if his eyes are intorted, and we can encourage that with an upright eye position. And why am I using the eyes to help remind the brain how to do a vestibular function? I just showed you guys the web. It's all all connected. It's all connected. And so I found one thing to help my patient, but I like to have two things on this one. And so what else happens when we are tilting to the left? We're ready to fall to the left. So I'm gonna have you put your body in the left fall position. Left arm out, like you're gonna fall. Left head tilt, eyes closed. If his body's in a left fall, it reminds the utricle how to fall tilt left. Back to neutral. Into a right fall position with a left utricle activation. Nice and strong, doesn't help. Why would it? It's a backwards activation. It makes no sense to the brain to fall right and tilt left. So treatment is simple, okay? We're gonna have you go into a left fall pattern. We're gonna have you go into a left head tilt. We're gonna have you look up and to the right. We're gonna take what he can't do and then we're gonna combine it with the things that allowed him to do what he can do. We're gonna laser the brain stem. We're gonna add a deep tendon reflex and the deed is done, back to neutral, okay? Treatment is 20 seconds. Diagnosis is important. And we took our time going through diagnosis because this is a new patient and he needs to see how it flows to understand it. But after we get through the first visit, it takes me two minutes to do that. And we can pluck one out of your ear this visit. We can pluck a proprioceptive functional neurologic lesion out of that SCM next visit. And then the next visit, we're gonna check your eyes. And the last visit, we'll rewire your brainstem. And that is going to help you hold better. And that's what I've seen clinically. So arms out, eyes closed. Tilt your head left, normal, 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 normal. You can tilt left again. Thank you, Zoolander. (laughs) Thank you. So so when you guys heard a little story from Dr. Patzer about how I helped his dizziness, that was it. That was it. It was a three minute treatment. We did it one time only. And how you been? We, he had a functional neurologic lesion in his utricle. And, and how well have you been holding since we did that? All right, well, there goes my theory. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, that's the idea. And so I will teach you guys in my course how to do the ears, how to do the eyes, how to do the brain stem, how to do the neck, and how to really round out everything. And so we got to wrap this up. And in order to do that, 
We're going to bring it one more time back to Ash Catch. Um, hopefully now you too believe me, I want to be the very best there ever was, like no one ever was. But my addendum is, as an upper cervical doctor, to adjust them all is my real quest and to hold them is my cause. So I thank you guys so much. <laughs>